Yeah, uh, it's always great to see people connecting with each other uh, during church. So keep that going after. You've got a great opportunity to do that after the service. But um, I just wanted to let you all know that I've been in trouble with the police before. Yeah. I'm not talking about a speeding ticket. I'm talking, I was somewhere I shouldn't be doing something I shouldn't be doing. Yeah, I was 19 years of age. I was with a couple of friends. And we'd just gotten into parkour. <laughs> So my friends and I, we were in the phase of our life where we were climbing up things, where we were jumping off high things, where we were rolling over other things, and trying to run from a place as fast as possible to another place as fast as possible. You got what I meant by that sentence. But one day, we saw something See, in Ballarat, we have a university, and I was surprised, but it's uh, <laughs> called the University of Ballarat. <laughs> but at the University of Ballarat, they have a whole bunch of student accommodation. And all of it is exactly the same types of houses. And these houses were pretty like standard. They were two or three stories, because they tried to fit as many people in there as possible. But they had these really steep roofs. And I remember my friends and I, we often thought about how fun they would be to climb. And uh, we realised that it was school holidays or uni holidays and that no one was on res anymore. And so we went to the student res. And when we got there, it was even better than we ever imagined. See, in Ballarat, it rains a lot. Like, a lot. Like, two-thirds of the year, it rains. That's how much it rains in Ballarat. And so, when... You build something in Ballarat, you have to take that into account. And so what the university had done is that they connected all of the houses together with a walkway that was covered. And so you could literally get on the walkway and run from, from one house to the other, climb the roof, slide back down it, and then run to the next house. Now us boys, this was obviously too tempting. And, um, we went to the university and we would time ourselves about how fast we could climb up a roof, slide back down and run to the next house, climb up and slide back down and time ourselves and do all of these cool things. We would like see how quickly we could like jump up onto the walkway, how quickly we could jump off, do all of this crazy stuff. And we went there for about 30 to 40 minutes, having a whole bunch of fun and realised, oh, you know what, let's move on to the next adventure. But as we got down from the roof, we heard this guy yelling at us, Oi, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, we didn't really think anything of it, so we were like, okay, we waited for this guy, which is done. We were 19, we should just run. <laughs> he wasn't going to catch us, he was 40. Like, you know, uh, and we did parkour, if you didn't notice. <laughs> but we wait, and again, because we didn't think we'd really done anything wrong, he says, you boys need to wait here. I've called university security, and they're on their way, and I'm about to call the police. Sure, call the police. We would try, try and act all tough and cool, you know, like we couldn't let our 19 year old friends know that we were all scared a little bit because we didn't know if we'd prove it, any laws or not. But um, we waited there for again about 30 to 40 minutes just standing there with two university security guards, both in about their 40s or 50s, and this 40 year old man. Again, I looked back and thought we should have just run. Like again, <laughs> we could have waited there and been like, actually, now's the time, let's just go, let's just run off on them. But we waited all the way into the police came out. Now, you know that it's serious when they send one police officer. <laughs> that was a joke. It wasn't serious. But this police officer comes out and he uh, gets out of the car and this guy, who obviously thought he was a legend making a citizen's arrest, and uh, goes over to the police officer and explains what happened. It's like, yeah, I found these boys uh, on the top of the roof. You know, I don't know what they were getting up to, but probably nothing good, you know, whatever. But, the police officer responded like this. He heard what the guy said, and all he did was this. <sighs> I think because he knew it was a dud job. He was, knew that there wasn't really anything serious that we'd done. He knew that really it was a waste of his time, and so what he did was he did the classic cop thing. 
he split us up, the three of us. There was me and two of my other friends, and he split us up into three. He did the whole group, you know, what were you doing while we got there? Now, our story was that we were throwing a tennis ball to each other, and we'd accidentally thrown it on the roof. We couldn't remember which roof, so we were running between them. <laughs> some reason, we didn't have a tennis ball, we didn't find it, it must have been in the bushes. That was our story. Anyway, he goes around and does the, does the loop, and he brings us back together, and he does the classic, I'm a cop, I'm going to scare these punk teenage boys so they don't do this again. So he comes over to us and he says, and I can see this now at 28, but when I was 19 it was a little bit scary, okay, I'll admit it, I was afraid. But he comes over to us and he goes, well boys, uh, you know, doesn't look like you've done anything wrong here. Just so you know, there's been some thefts in the area, you know, people have been stealing from the student res, so we're gonna have to uh, sort of dust down the area, just double check that uh, this wasn't for you, and we may need to call you to bring you in to uh, get your fingerprints to just double check what's going on here. And we're like, yeah, okay, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Internally, we're like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go on the record. Like, you know, like, it's gonna be there. But we go home, uh, and as we're walking home, we're all talking about how we're gonna sort of tell our parents. Now, there's me, I'm going to tell my parents, I'm a pastor's kid, so I'm already a little bit nervous about how that's going to go. Hey, Mum, Dad, I was just in trouble with the cops. Anyway, cool, let's go on. Uh, but then my other friend, Dale, uh, was there, and I've got another friend, but I'm going to change his name because what happened to him is too embarrassing. Now, to help you understand what happened to this guy, he's kind of like super conservative, loves following rules. When I think of what he's like, I kind of think of Danny. <laughs> okay, you know, like really conservative, really funny, and we're just going to call him Danny because Danny can also be a boy's name, okay? Yeah, that's cool, and you'll all remember it now this way, and every time you look at Danny, you'll remember what happened to my friend, so it's a real win win. Uh, but to be clear, it's a boy, not Danny, we weren't friends at 19 at all. Um, I didn't know it. And anyway, so we all go home, I go back, I tell my parents they're fine, Dale goes home, he's fine because he has some like older siblings who have been in way more trouble than he was, so his friend's like, oh phew, that was all, like, that's fine. <laughs> But Danny, Danny boy goes home and his parents are strict. His parents are conservative. His parents have two older siblings, like older kids, who were like OP1, OP2 type students. Teachers pets, never broke a rule. Perfect, already in their dream jobs. And here he is, Danny, walking back in and going, I'm the first of my family to get a job with the boys. I don't even know if I'm projected to get an OP2. You know, like I'm going to get a job. Family. That's what he's thinking. He goes in and he explains to his parents what happened. And he tells them, like a fool, that he may get called into the police station for his fingerprints to get taken. It's at that point his parents lose their mind. They're like, what? What the heck's going on? What, what happened? Blah, blah, blah. Like, going. And they start dishing out all of the punishments. And they're like, you know what? You're banned from your computer for a whole month. You know, like, no touching it. And Danny Boy loved his computer. Then he was grounded for a whole month. You can't see anybody. And then his parents, without him saying that he'd been hanging out with Dale and I because he didn't want us to get in any more trouble than necessary, they said, we know that you were with Ben and Dale and you can never see them ever again. Ever again. I still haven't seen him. <laughs> He's all right. But the last one was, they saved it. Like, it was the best. Well, no, it's the best for me. It was the worst for him. They wanted to humiliate him. They wanted him to know just how much trouble he was in. And we all know there's only one thing you can do to let people know how much trouble they're in. Oh, His parents <laughs> took him into the lounge room, pulled down his pants and smacked him. <laughs> I got a text message that night. I don't know how he had this funny if he was great from his computer. But he told me his parents full on smacked him. 19 year old boy getting smacked by his parents because he got in trouble with the cops. Anyway, if you knew Danny, you'd be laughing at just as much as I am. So funny. But what I wanted to highlight out of that story is just that one moment where they realised who Danny had been hanging out with by what he'd done. Notice how they said, We know that you were with Ben and Dale. And the reason for this is because they knew that Danny would have never done something like that on his own. Never would have done anything like that on his own. But they knew 
that Ben and Dale would do something like that on their own. <laughs> and then this time, unfortunately, their poor son had got caught up in our reckless, mischievous behaviour. But they knew who he'd been with by what he'd done. And I don't know if you've ever had a situation like this where maybe your parents have called you out on something or you've seen uh, some people and you've started to change behaviour, but how often can we tell who people have been with by how they're acting, how they're thinking, what they're saying? I don't know about, about you, but maybe when you catch up with some old high school friends or some people that you used to live with or some other influential people in your life, you start doing things. You're like, why am I doing this? Why am I talking this way? Why am I saying this thing? Why am I doing this weird thing with my hands? I only ever do this when I'm with these friends. Maybe some of you, it's mannerisms. I lie on the couch like my dad lies on the couch. You know, like those sort of moments where you start to look and be like other people. It's actually a psychological phenomenon called social contagion that does this. See, social contagion is the thing where all of a sudden you see someone say something and you go, I like that person and I'm going to say it too. See, I think this meme kind of like summarizes what social contagion is like. One of my new friends uses their own slang that I've never used before in my life. Me subconsciously, I'll pepper that into my conversation starting to You know, like we've all been there. We hear a cool word and we're like, that's amazing. I'm going to use that. That is social contagion. And I know it sounds like a disease that you guys are scared of, but I'm telling you, it's a serious thing. Sociologists have done studies that have found that you're easily influenced by the people around you. If you're on an aeroplane and the person in your row buys something, say it's a movie, say it's a snack, a drink, whatever, you are 30% more likely to do the same. Here's where it gets serious though. If you're married, your risk of divorce increases if your friends get divorced. A decision that you would think would be highly personal and highly like immune from influence increases if your friends are getting divorced. But get this, your chance of divorce increases if friends of your friends are getting divorced. See, social contagion is a serious phenomenon. It happens in the subtle things, and it happens in the major things. Sociologists also say that you today are the sum total of your five most influential people in your life. And the reason for that is social contagion. That we take on the thoughts, the behaviours, the worldview, the perspective of those that we most closely do life with. And my question to you is if we were to look at your life today, who would we say that you've been with? Who would be the people that we would list? Who are the people who are most informing and influencing your behaviours, your thoughts, your perspectives, your mannerisms? Who are those and tonight, I want to dive into this passage in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, where we can un understand and unpack a little bit of this dynamic and how it impacts and relates to our relationship with Jesus. And how actually we can use this phenomenon, use this reality of our social relationships to have Jesus be a key influencing force in our lives. And so we're going to jump into Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. So if you've got your Bibles with you, please open it up. But before we do that, and as you kind of get to it, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background, because Acts 4 flows directly out of Acts 3. And so in Acts 3, what we see is that Peter and John are on their way to go to the temple. And as they get to the temple, they see a man who cannot walk. Now this is where Peter does his like, famous uh, speech. If you haven't heard it, it's real cool. But he goes up to this guy... And he's like, I see that you're begging. I don't have any money for you, but I can give you Jesus. Now get up and walk. And then this guy's like walking. And what happens is he stands up and walks, and everyone is amazed at what happened and crowd around Peter. And what Peter does is Peter then decides, you know what, I'm going to drop the most fire sermon that I've ever dropped in my whole entire life. And he starts telling these people all these crazy things. He's like, you know what, Jesus is the Lord. You killed him. 
but he is the reason that this guy's standing. Everyone's like, whoa, that's so amazing. Like, what the heck? I mean, I'm, back. I'm sad that I killed Jesus, but like, this is cool. And then we see Acts 4, verses 1 to 30. I'm going to quickly read through this, and then we're going to see what we can learn uh, from this story about how we can be with Jesus. So, we see this. It says, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed them, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. And they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the, builder, uh, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And verse 13 is where I really want to spend the rest of this message, that they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, the situation that Peter and John find themselves in is quite a tense intimidating situation. While we don't really see it here, it mentions a few names of the people that would have been in the room. The truth is that John and Peter the next morning were brought before 72 of the most influential and important leaders of the time, religious leaders of the time. Now to put that in perspective, that's like meeting John, uh, being in a meeting with John Piper, Tim Keller, Stephen Furtick, Andy Stanley, Rick Warren, Joyce Meyer, and 66 other influential Christian leaders to your account for what you've done and what you've said. That sounds terrifying. And I would know I met Greg Rochelle, so <laughs> that's only one. Imagine 71 more of them. It'd be a nightmare. But Peter had been in a similar situation before where he was under the pump. For those of you who may not be aware, Peter, uh, before Jesus had died, had made a big promise to Jesus that he would never deny him, he would never leave him, he will always be by his side, even though Jesus told him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He's like, no, I won't, I'll be there till the end, I'll make it through. So Peter's made this big promise, and all of a sudden, Jesus gets arrested. And we see that Peter, on that night, gets asked three times, are you one of the people who follows Jesus. And unfortunately for Peter, each of those three times, he denies knowing Jesus. And you might not pick it up, but there's just this little thing in this passage. See, Peter had to be asked if he was a follower of Jesus. So Peter was around the area where Jesus was, but he had to be asked if he was a follower of Jesus. Because I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but if you were a true follower of Jesus and you'd made such big, bold declarations that you would never leave him, that you would be by his side, wouldn't you imagine that he would have been closer to the action? That he would have been somehow trying to fight for Jesus, somehow trying to work the situation so that Jesus could be set free from what he knows is like a totally ridiculous charge. But instead... Peter's outside, near the fire, trying to be near enough to hear what's going on, but not in any trouble of being found out and involved in what Jesus is going through. See, Peter talked a big game, but he didn't live up to it. 
And the challenge for us in this is that Peter had been doing ministry with Jesus for three years. It wasn't like they were strangers. They lived and breathed, eaten together, probably slept in the same house together, done everything together for three whole years. And yet in this moment, these people can't tell if Peter is a follower of Jesus. There's a hint. There's like, oh, he sounds like it. Are you one of those like Nazarene people? Were you out in like Galilee? Is that, is that you? Are you one of those people? There's a hint, but they're not really sure, so they have to ask to double check. And I don't know about you, but I would have thought that after three years with this guy, you would imagine that something would have rubbed off, that he would have looked a little bit more like Jesus to the point that they would have known they wouldn't have needed to ask. And what I think it is, is that there's a difference between following someone and being with someone. See, uh, last Monday night, I went to a heavy metal show with uh, Max. Where is he? At the back there. My man, he's wearing the shirt from the band that we went to go and see. But if I told you that I followed Max to the metal show, yeah, you're laughing because it already sounds creepy, doesn't it? I followed Max to the metal show. It doesn't sound like we were together. It doesn't sound like we spent any time together. It doesn't sound like we're friends or in relationship in any way at all. And in fact, it probably sounds like Max was at the front and I was standing in the back watching him the whole entire time. Hey, Max. <laughs> Look cute or sweaty like that. <laughs> but if I said that I was with Max at this metal show, Notice how it changes how you relate to it. It doesn't sound as creepy. It sounds like we went as friends, which we did. It sounds like we probably spent most of the night together, which we did, until Max got into the mosh pit and got lost in the crowd and came out alive somehow. <laughs> but that's the difference. See, Peter was a follower of Jesus, but I sometimes wonder if he was ever really with Jesus. And it kind of makes sense. Like, we live in a world where we follow a whole lot of people. I don't know how many people follow on Instagram or how many people you're friends with on Facebook, but we all know that there's a lot of people that we follow in this life, but there's only a few people that we really do life with. And I imagine that for you, you're not listing all of the different people that you follow as the most influential people in your life, but rather the people that you are doing life with. And Peter had been following Jesus. But I wonder if he'd always really been with Jesus. He had in the physical sense, but had he let Jesus be one of the main driving, influencing forces of his life? I'm not sure. But that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we just people following Jesus? Or are we people who are being with Jesus? Because we can follow Jesus from a distance. You can follow Jesus by just looking ahead and going, all right, I think this is the direction that Jesus is going. I think this is how Jesus wants me to do life. I think this is how Jesus sees this situation. I think this, I think this, I think this. Based on kind of where he's going and what he's doing. Or you can choose to do life with Jesus. Near Jesus. Close to Jesus. In a way that lets Jesus just rub off a little bit on who you are. That actually, as you spend time with him, close to him, near him, his behaviours rub off on you. His thinking rubs off on you. His perspective rubs off on you. You're actually not necessarily trying to follow him. You're just doing life with him. And slowly but surely, it all rubs off on you. And you begin to become like him. How would we describe your relationship with Jesus tonight? Are you a follower of Jesus? Or are you doing life with Jesus? And so we notice in this passage that firstly they had to ask Peter back in the day, but now in this passage the religious leaders are astonished and note that he had been with Jesus. And that always leaves us with the question, why do the people know that he has been with Jesus? Now you could quickly argue because he's telling them that Jesus is Lord, yes, great, but that doesn't help me with what I'm about to say, okay? So let's just be open-minded. Why do they know that he has been with Jesus? I do believe it's because they're declaring it, but I also think there's a different, a different reason to it. And I think it's this. I think for them, the 72 of them were sitting in that room, 
talking to Peter and John about what had happened, and all of a sudden, it felt like deja vu. It felt like they were in the same situation that they'd been in before, but with Jesus. See, we notice in this passage that it says these sentences. It says that in verse 13, that Peter and John were unqualified, ordinary men. Unqualified, ordinary men. And now, while it's hard for us to imagine that Jesus was an unqualified, ordinary man, but when you actually think about the religious leaders, the people who are sitting here experiencing Peter and John, and who sat there and experienced Jesus on the other side, Jesus to them was an unqualified, ordinary man. I know that almost said, I feel uncomfortable saying that. It sounds heretical for those of us who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But in their filter, in their culture, he was unqualified and ordinary. See, these religious leaders had a trained heart and had passed all of these different tests at various stages in their lives that qualified them to do a whole lot of rigorous religious training. Now, you've got to think, these are the 72 most elite. These are the brainiest, the best Pharisees out of all of the bunch, and they qualified to do that. Unfortunately, the truth is that Peter, John, and Jesus all failed that training because none of them are rabbis. None of them are religious leaders. They all fail that training. So compared to these religious leaders, they are deeply unqualified. That's why they had to go and learn their family trade. That's why they had to go and provide an income for themselves because they were unqualified for religious service. As terrible as it feels for me to say, Jesus was unqualified for these men. And the other thing is they never at all believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They weren't even sure if he was really a prophet. They didn't know what to do with Jesus, but they treated him like an ordinary man. But every time they interacted with Jesus, there was this unqualified, ordinary man speaking confidently and boldly with profound insight, challenging the current system, challenging the religious leaders themselves, and somehow having a ridiculous miracle. Also on the side, oh, there's a guy who was blind that can now see. Oh, another man who can't walk, now walking. You know, all of these things. And they didn't know what to do with it. Imagine experiencing that, an unqualified, ordinary man doing these things. And all of a sudden, they're talking to Peter and John. And they're having the exact same experience. Peter is standing there, confidently, unashamedly telling them that they killed the Son of God. Telling them about all of the things that they need to know that salvation is only found in Jesus, not their good works. He's doing all of this. The very Peter who couldn't tell a teenage girl that he hung around with Jesus. Now I get it, teenage girls are scary, but he couldn't even do that. And now he's standing in front of the 72 most influential religious leaders of his time, telling them the truth, confidently, boldly. And there stands a man who couldn't walk, who now walks. And so while they knew that he had been with Jesus because he was telling them, they also knew that he'd been with Jesus because all of a sudden it felt like they were with Jesus all over again. And my question for you, is it that easy in your life to see that you've been with Jesus too? When people come into contact with you, does it feel like they've been with Jesus? Jesus. Now we live in a culture that's not necessarily super engaged in church or Christianity, and I know they definitely don't have a, a necessarily a good rapport with that, but I do believe that the world around us does have some perspective around who Jesus is. Now I found this video on YouTube, and you're going to have to excuse, excuse the quality, I'm pretty sure it's from 2003, you're also going to have to excuse the sunglasses that uh, some of these people are wearing, they're hideous. But <laughs> this video, this man goes around and just asks people, What do you think of Jesus, and what do you think of Christians? And we're going to watch it, and I want you to note what's said about both different parties. Let's throw it to the screen, and let's see what they have to say. My savior. Good guy. Um, love, compassion, um, diversity, An Easter, loving, bearded, kind. We've got a good opinion. Of Jesus Christ, that's for sure. He's an excellent man, but wonderful. Sure, they've had every religion of him. My savior. Actually, Jesus was the first punk rocker. Yeah? Yeah. He is, he's pretty cool, and I like him a lot. Savior. Flex. It's good. Yeah, good. That's Jesus. What else would you think of? Sincere, 
uneducated, backward, the South. I think of somebody that's possibly just a little bit, um, a little bit overboard, a little bit extreme. My uncle Bob, um, conservative, white. Fanatical though. Bike covers. Crazy. <laughs> People who wear white and like kind of glow, but are kind of freaky. Yeah, and um, Texas. I think there's a lot of sti stigmas attached to that word. I can't answer that. <laughs> Crazy. Frightening. Interesting comparison, isn't it? The thing that I find most interesting is that I actually think the description of who Jesus was was pretty accurate. But unfortunately, their experience of Christians was not quite the same. Unfortunately, that means that it doesn't feel like they've been with Jesus when they've been with Christians. And it's challenging, because I don't know about you, but it feels hard sometimes to like be like Jesus. Because it feels like you're just trying to be a nice person. Like, you're trying to be kind, I'm trying to be compassionate. But what's interesting to note is they know what it would feel like to be with Jesus. And what I hope is that we can be people that when we are with others, it feels like they are also with Jesus. And really, it's, it's not that difficult. As we talked about earlier, we see how people's behaviours, thoughts, worldviews, thinking, perspective, all of these things rub off on us and we can easily become like them. And we've seen how Peter became like Jesus in such a way that these people, these religious leaders, knew that he had been with Jesus based on what it felt like, on the experience that they were having just as much as what they were saying. And I think it's really important for us here tonight to think about that too. That actually people can know just as much that we have been with Jesus by what they experience when they are with us than from what we say to them. And all we have to do is choose to be people who will be with Jesus ourselves. See, Peter, I believe, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, all of a sudden realised that Jesus wasn't just someone to follow, but he was someone to do life with. That this was the very Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And maybe, just maybe, he knew how to live life. And that maybe if he could make him the center of his life, his life would be different too. And I actually believe that that promise is available to all of us. And you know, we see throughout the New Testament that there's these promises that if we will choose to be people who will be with Jesus, our lives will be changed. You know, we see in Corinthians, it talks about the, that when we uh, you know, choose to be with Christ, that the old has gone, the new has come. There's the promise of a new life. But it's not devoid from the fact that we must be with Jesus. And we've got it pretty good these days because while we can't walk around with Jesus like Peter got to do, we can access resources that help us know who Jesus was, what Jesus did, how Jesus thought, how Jesus interacted with different people. We can see all of that because we have the Bible with us today. Literally, the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, are all about the story of Jesus. Now, I've recently just been reading through the Gospels again with my youth team. We've been doing 30 days in the Gospels, reading through them all. And each day I get to wake up and I get to read about Jesus. I get to see what he does. I get to see how he thinks. I get to see some of the mannerisms and the way that he treats different people. And in that moment, you don't always think about it, but I'm spending time with Jesus. You get to spend time with Jesus. These are the moments, these are the times, we don't often think about it because they're our disciplines, they're just the things that we feel like we have to do in our faith, but these are the times... These are the moments we get to be with Jesus in such a way that our lives get changed and shaped because we catch what Jesus is doing. 
And we've got more than just that. We've got prayer. We can communicate with God. We've got silence. We can listen to God. We've got worship. We can praise God and remind ourselves of who He is and His character in a way that informs us. We've got all of these incredible things that can help them happen to help us be with Jesus. But the real reason that we can be people who will be with Jesus and can be with Jesus and be shaped by Jesus is because Jesus first came to be with us. See, in Genesis, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam and Eve and he walked with them in creation. He walked with them. They were in his presence. He was in their presence. They walked together in the Garden of Eden. And then sin entered and all of a sudden this relationship was severed. There was distance between the two. They were no longer with each other. They were no longer together anymore. But we see that God so loved us that he sent Jesus to come after us. That actually he came to be with us. We see in John 1, 14, it says this. It says, the word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. But I love how they say it in the message. It says this word, this, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. Moved into the neighborhood. It's just like Jesus is your next door neighbor. You can just go hang out with him whenever you want. See, God came to us. Jesus came to be with us so that we could be with him. See, he left the comfort of heaven to be with you. He left the ease of being in heaven, just being praised all the time. I mean, how nice would that be? I mean, I love getting words of encouragement. I just sit there all day and get praised. He left that to come and be despised, to be spat on, to be killed for you. Jesus has always wanted to be with you and he came to be with us so that we can be with him. Because he knows we're the very thing. He knows that he's the very thing that we need in our lives. That for all of us, if there's five people who are the most influential in shaping us, then Jesus always should be number one. That if we want to live a life that looks like him, if we want to live a life that shapes the lives of others, then he must be number one. And rightly so. Because he came to be with us. He sacrificed his life to be with you. And he rose again so that we can actually have a living relationship with a living person. That will change us and transform us from the inside out. We can be known as people who have been with Jesus because Jesus came to be with us. So my question to you as we come to finish is will you be someone who is known for being with Jesus? Will you be someone where people will look at you and go, they have been with Jesus? Because when they're with you, when they're in your presence, that feels like what it must feel like when they are with Jesus. Like, I don't know this Jesus guy very well, but all of these words that I think of perfectly embody you. I don't think it's heretical to say that Jesus wants to perfectly form himself in us. And we should want that too, because if Jesus embodied the perfect life, then the more that we look like him, the more that we live that life too. And all you have to do is be willing to make sure that you have been with Jesus. I mean, yeah, it's going to take some time, but all the good things do. You know, we've got all of these different things. It might be that you just need to make uh, the Bible more of an importance for you. It could be that you realize that you need to spend some time in prayer, communing, communicating with God, or in silence, just listening to Him. It could be in fasting, showing that you were dependent on Him. It could be in worship, reminding yourself of how good He has been to you. It could just be in community. Having other people influence you in ways that you didn't think possible. I mean, think about it. If friends of our friends can increase our risk of divorce, imagine what it could be if we actually used that here. That if we were a community that inspired one another to be with Jesus. See, I was just down at the Hillsong Creative Conference uh, just these last few days. And I don't really care what you think about Hillsong or the theology or any of those sort of things, whatever. But like, I was there and these people wanted to be with Jesus. I remember standing inside a stage, we're coming to this time of worship together, and uh, I don't know her last name, the Brook chick was Fraser, I don't know the new one, but she was standing up there, she'll always be Brooke Fraser to me, 
Uh, it sounded creepy. But <laughs> didn't mean like that. But you know, like, she was up there. She was just talking about how she was like, I just want to know Jesus. I just want to be with Jesus more. And I can't, I can't remember what she said, but I just remember standing there being like, yeah, I want that too. She's not even my friend. Don't even know her at all. Don't even know her last name, you know. And she is influencing me to worship Jesus. It was in that session that I was like, now stuff this. I'm going after Jesus. I don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care what's happening. I'm just going to do what I need to do to worship God all heart. And the truth is that we can all have that impact on one another. That this is a community that can support and influence one another. That actually, you might look a little bit more like Jesus in certain areas of your life. And if we can spend enough time together, maybe it'll just rub off on me too. Community is such an important part of helping us be like Jesus and be known as people who have been with Jesus. But when we do that, it's, it's so subtle, but we get to go and be people who carry Jesus into a whole variety of different situations and circumstances. You know, it could be at lunch at work, probably not for me because I'm at church, but um, maybe for you, you know, you go on lunch at work and you sit there and there's a, a presence, a love, a compassion, a care, that you just get to give other people because you know that when Jesus was with other people, those were the exact same things he gave them too. And these people, they walk away from lunch going, what was that? I don't know what that was, but I've never had a conversation quite like that in my life. And maybe they'll just like, maybe I've been with Jesus, I don't know if it's Jesus guy, but he seemed like a really nice guy. This guy does too. Maybe it'll just be, you know, in some of your friendships, people at uni, just the fact that there's this sense of care and compassion for them. They're going through some of the difficult situations. And even though you didn't seem that close, for some reason you've been the most compassionate, caring, and thoughtful person in their world. Because that's who Jesus was to those in need too. Maybe it's the homeless people in the world around you who you actually all of a sudden just have this real passion and art for them. And you go and serve them and care for them. And what you don't realize is you're taking Jesus to them in such a way that maybe they think to themselves, God hasn't abandoned me. Maybe there's people in this world who care about me. Maybe there's a God who does too. You get to go and be Jesus to these people. It's incredible that we get the privilege to do this. And all we have to do is be people who will be with Jesus. Because Jesus will do everything he can to be with us. And to change us and transform us from the inside out. And what I want to do is, uh, as we finish is just think about this. That actually we get to be these people. We get to go and, and do that and live this life. And we get to do it together. We get to do it in this community. That this community as a whole could actually be known as a community that has been with Jesus. That as people who are new or visiting come through this door, there's something different about this place. Because we've been with Jesus. We've come together on a Sunday, not just thinking, I can't wait to catch up with my friends, but actually going, this is my time to be with Jesus worship him, to be in prayer with him, to listen to his word, to understand who he is and what he's done. I can do this and do you know what? I can spur one another on to. I can actually decide that I am going to worship Jesus as wholeheartedly as I can. And you know what? I just want to take a, a second to honor some of these guys who have come down the front and done that. You know, it might not have been inspiring to you, but it was to me. And that's important. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe there's just a friend or someone in your life or in this community who might inspire you to pray because you see how fervently they pray. Or to worship by how, how much they hunger after God's presence or His Word because you just see that they bring their Bible every single week and, every week and that thing is tattered. Like, it's a wreck, but they just love it. And, you know, that's how he's really read the Bible a lot. You know, that classic one, those who love Jesus read the Bible, and it's a mess. There goes the digital Bible, hey? But these things are important. We can do that together. We can be those people. We can be a community that's known for having been with Jesus. We can be people that's known for having been with Jesus. All we have to do is be with Jesus. Make him a priority. Give him our time. Give him our focus. Let him rub off on us. And what I want to do as we uh, finish up right now is I want to just create an opportunity to respond. And I know that there's two responses tonight. And the first one is for those of you here tonight who... You might not have a relationship with Jesus at all. You feel like you don't know him. You feel like you have nothing to do with him. But right now, you know in your heart you want to be with Jesus. That there's a goodness of life that you know you can only find in him. That there's something about who he is that draws you to him. You know that you need to be with Jesus. 
And if that's you in a moment, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to just close your eyes and raise your hand uh, where you are. And all you're doing when you raise your hand is just identifying with that and saying, yep, that's me, I, I wanna be with Jesus. Then we're gonna pray a prayer that's gonna ask Jesus into your heart so that you can be with him. His spirit will be within you. I know that's a complex thing, but that's how close Jesus gets to you. He literally comes and is a part of your life and your heart. But we're gonna give you that opportunity just to say, yep, I wanna be with Jesus tonight. Say yes to him. He's come to be with me, and you know what? I need him in my life right now. So we're just going to close our eyes and bow our heads. And if that's you tonight, if you know that you haven't been with Jesus your entire life, or maybe you've been distant from Jesus for a long time and you know you need to come back to him, if that's you, can you just raise your hand saying, Yep, I want to be with Jesus? Thank you. 
embarrassed because everyone's sitting and looking, but if that's you, just come out in the front and you want to be with Jesus, it's great. If you want to get baptized, just grab the, the baptismal towel as well and then come and stand with the rest of them. If that's you, you know you're being distant and you want to be near him, come down the front and go pray for him. Anyone else? I'm going to hold on much longer, 10 seconds. Come on. Don't wait. Why would you wait to be with Jesus when you can just do it now? Hey, like why go home and be like, oh Jesus, Some of these are your friends. Feel free to come down the front and pray for them too. You know, we love to do this together. Let's do it. All right. If that's you, if you say, you know what, I want to be with Jesus. I feel like I've been following him but not being with him. You just like, just put your hands out. Just put your hands out as if you're ready to receive what God has for you tonight. Thank you. 